because we all subscribe to car and driver and road and track and car craft and etc. And there was no road and track. I mean, I can't, I, I only picture road and track covers with your renderings. Do you have any stats on how many you did or what percent you did? No, I can't, but I've worked for them for 25 years. They gave me the first, uh, uh, the first cover, which was a Porsche 928 prediction. Ended up at the end working for more than 50 magazines worldwide. I also worked a lot for, uh, for Motor Trend, of course. The Swiss Germans, um, they are very conservative on the outside, but inside they are as kinky as you can imagine. Okay, now at the time, car design. And uh, a good friend of mine from New Zealand, he took me to Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. And oh my God, I thought I was so great when I saw those illustrations over there. I came out about this big. Most important, and it may be the only thing we keep on this whole recording, is you meeting Bear Tone in a very special place. That is the truth. And uh, <laughs> that, was in the, in <laughs> that was in the man's bathroom. Jeff Stearns, connected through cars. If they're bigwigs, we'll have them on the show. And yes, we'll talk about cars and everything else. Here he is now, Jeff Stearns. Jeff Stearns, connected through cars with a guy that I've been worshiping since high school, Mark Sterenberger. Now, in my high school art class, I used to sit by a guy named Mark Walters, who could draw the, the most amazing automotive renderings in the world. I thought I was good, but he was unbelievable. Mark went off to become a designer for Citroen and Peugeot. For those of you that remember the Road and Track magazine, the, the renderings on the cover, if you look at what the very, very unique, matter of fact, I'll have my editor put it on the screen, signature. Mark and I in high school used to always try to write our name the way Mark would sign these renderings. So Mark is, I've really idolized him, and I can't believe I was able to get him on my show. And it turns out that this friend of mine that I grew up with was a student of Mark Sterenberger uh, in his design. Now, my buddy Mark is not chopped liver either. He designed this uh, tomahawk that I, I can't remember the name of the Chrysler exec that wrote it out onto the floor. Wolfgang Bernhardt. So this was when Daimler Chrysler, when, when they merged when they merged. So it was originally, if I'm not mistaken, a Mercedes exec that ended up in the in the role at Chrysler, rolled out onto the stage, and my buddy Mark Walters designed this the dual front wheel. A totally cool machine. Totally cool. But more important, I just discovered something right before I uh, am introducing the show. Mark has potato in the pants <laughs> dot com. And on Instagram, you definitely need to look at potato in the pants. Do I have that right, Mark? You have it nailed. So let's just talk about that because you've now brought me to a new level of interest. When we were warming up before we um, started the show, <laughs> I was giving you a little bit of my father's shtick, and you were right there on it, right there on it. And I brought up this story about my father would tell me to put a potato in my bathing suit at Clearwater Beach to, to meet girls. And then you're like, oh, look at potato in the pants dot com. That's me. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, there's no way. He's just you're ne so I'm called Mr. Potato in the pants. Now, is that organic or <laughs> or an actual prosthetic device of some sort? Uh, it's uh, actually like a stuffed animal that you put in the front. Oh, I thought you meant this was your actual anatomy. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And uh, like, like we said, uh, the caution that you have to put it in the front, not in the back. You're much more popular if you put it in the front at the beach. Okay, well, we, we are promoting this. We are, Mark, in his retirement, to keep him out of a strictly... Uh, scratch and dent department in the grocery store we need to buy go to potato in the pants <laughs> this is amazing this is i can't even i'm gonna send you one well you know it might help because i actually have a little bit of a birth disorder i don't know if you ever heard of it called um in infant penis uh okay that happened to some people <laughs> 
Now, this is why I married an Asian girl, because she was like, oh, not bad. Hey, wait a minute. My first wife was Asian as well. Well, she may have been impressed as well. <laughs> Jeff, you're dynamite. <laughs> I can't believe it. I'm so glad we're getting to know each other here. And for the right reasons, right? So, obviously excited to have you on. Now, Mark, I, you know, I know you've heard this from a, a million fans. I know it. I, I know that people, you're humble. I mean, you're fun. You're not low-key, but you're humble, and you know, you're larger than life, and you're so fun and so playful and so approachable. But when I tell buddies that I'm getting ready to record one of these with you, a few of my buddies that I grew up with, because we all subscribe to car and driver and road and track and car craft and etc. And there was no road and track. I mean, I can't, I only picture road and track covers with your renderings. Do you have any stats on how many you did or what percent you did? No, I can't, but I've worked for them for 25 years. They gave me the first, uh, uh, the first cover, which was a Porsche 928 prediction. I forgot what year it was, but um, uh, yeah, Bill Mata, who was the art director, good friend of mine passed away some time ago uh, he actually opened the door for that for me to get into that and uh, ended up at the end working for more than 50 magazines worldwide in all languages i wrote a column in german one of all languages a monthly column and um I really enjoyed that, but Road and Track was very close to me. I also worked a lot for uh, for Motor Trend, of course. With Road and Track, I felt like I was in the family, in, in a family, and uh, so they gave me the exposure that uh, I needed. I'm sure that I've seen you and others. I got all the magazines growing up, and at one time I was getting, I mean, until 10 or 15 years ago, I think I was getting um, 15 <laughs> publications in the mail, of which... A couple of them were weekly, like Auto Week and Automotive News. And so I, I used to consume this stuff like crazy and just uh, loved it when I was running uh, dealerships. But I, I associated you with Road and Track, and I'm sure I'd seen you in others, but that's like the logo that I pictured. Now, if I recall, and I don't know if it was in this magazine or another, you used to do like a design study. Am I right? Where you would have a rendering of the car and have arrows pointing to something and say, here's this. and here. That was cool. I, I like to do that. So this first cover that you got was your imagination of what the 928 was going to be before there were any press photos or spy photos or anything else? How close were you? And how close was that? I was very, very close. Okay. How about that? Not close enough for, the, for me to get into trouble with, with the car companies. As a matter of fact, it was just the opposite. My illustrations, they opened the door for going into actually auto design. You know, they became aware of their, they read the magazine, just like you and I. And they thought, who the hell is that guy? Let's contact him. And that's how I got my very first assignment was with Volkswagen of America. And that was before the Rabbit came out. It was not ready yet, and their sales with the bug went into the basement. And they needed something real quick, a quick fit. I proposed, they came to me and I proposed, hey, why don't we just have some real nasty colors, you know, very colorful. We had greens, we have yellows and all. Why don't we paint the, the bumpers black? Why don't we put some nice wheels on that thing? Have some stripes at the time, you know, rally stripes. And they just needed another year. They needed to buy another year until the rabbit was ready. And they put it out and it, they thought that they could do about 5,000 of them. It was gone in a jiff, and they um, did it for the whole year long. They were doing very well with the old bug. And then, uh, you know, when the, the rabbit came on the market, they dropped that one, but uh, it was a hit. And they're still here in California, primarily. You still see a lot of them around. My brother had a rabbit, and unfortunately, it was automatic, and I'm pretty sure uh, for the first 50 feet, I could out-accelerate it on foot. Did you, disown, did you disown your brother for that? For going automatic or uh... no? It was no, and not his fault. My dad would come across various used cars, and he would just say, "Here's what you get next." But I'll tell you another deadly slow car that I think we had at the exact same time, which was a Porsche 924 automatic. Yeah, you didn't want to. Yeah, you didn't want to go automatic. 
the rabbit, I honest to God, now that I think about it, I think we raced. I think the rabbit was faster off the line. Well, you know, it, it put Volkswagen on the map, yeah. Sure, and then, of course, that led to GTI. Now, when you're drawing cars, is it here's how it's going to look and then let the engineers have at it? Or do you also do an engineering component or how everything will work and knowing there's got to be room for the transmission and suspension? How do you, how do you look approach it? You know, each and every uh, contract is different. Most of the time I do get the packaging drawing, you know, the, the mechanical stuff underneath, and uh, I, I close it up. I, I put closing on that thing. No, I do not do a, a lot of engineering. Sometimes I rec- uh, inquire, okay, in order to make it look better, can we put one component that is now intruding? Uh, can we put it somewhere else or, you know, so that we can lower the hood, for instance? But primarily it is the packaging that, they, uh, that I get and I have to draw around that, design around that. And... Um, it worked out very well. I like I like that. I'm not an engineer so much. You know, I look on the outside. I'm flaky. I just look on the outside. So does that mean you you don't enjoy doing or don't do interiors? I've done interiors, but you know what? I find out uh, I'm limited by that. Well, one of them that I'm looking at my notes over here, the 2002 Multipla. Mm-hmm. Well, that I didn't do that one, but I sure um, <laughs> that's my favorite car. The um, but the dashboard. Did you like that or no? I did, and I'll tell you why. Every morning when I got into that car, I had it for uh, let's see, from 2002 until about eight years. I had it, and I loved that thing. It lo- it is ugly, you know, as hell, but it was unique and it was super practical. Three seats across, two rows, all the space you needed. It. Uh, I had a turbo diesel. I'm talking about in Europe now. And uh, I could get a thousand kilometers out of one tank, which made me, I could drive from here to Siberia, you know, something like that, <laughs> which I didn't do. But uh, anyway, I loved that car because it was so ugly. And, you know, every morning I look at the car in the garage and I thought, gee, it's, it's like an ugly baby, you know, you feel pity for it. But yeah. what really intrigued me was every time I got into the car uh, in the morning, there was one more bubble. It, you know, it mutated overnight. You'd find another one. There's another one, you know. We'll show a picture of that dash. I'm sure I've ridden in that car as a taxi in Europe. Uh, yeah, they, you know, to this day they still have them, especially in, uh, you know, in Italy. And I lost that thing. I, I went over those Swiss Alpine passes, you know, at 100 miles per hour. And the, 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 the roadability and everything was just excellent. It was totally underrated. But it was a good car. It was one of my most reliable automobiles I've ever had, believe it or not. It's hard to believe with the Fiat label. No, nobody believes me. You know what? You know, I spend about three, four months every year I spend in Europe. And I had the car garaged over there. So all I had to do, connect the battery, turn the key, and it came on. It was just incredible. Now, are you still going to Europe every year? Well, I didn't the last year, and I can't wait. I'm itchy. Yeah, I need to go back again, you know, and I will for a few months. Now you're from you're from Switzerland. From Switzerland, and you're from the German area. Jawohl. <laughs> from. <laughs> so your your personality makes no sense to me whatsoever, Mark. It is not. It's totally off. It. I mean, from your part of the world, I mean. <laughs> To have personality and to have a little bit of it, I know you say you're not an engineer, you're more of an artist, but you have a lot of personality for that part of the world. That's Well, that's all fake, you know, that is fake. I faked that. But the, pers- the personality that you have is fake or the dryness that everyone else from that region has? You know, the, the, Swiss, the Swiss Germans, um, they are very conservative on the outside, but inside they are as kinky as you can imagine. Seriously, I, I, I'm uh, surprised every time I go there. You have open palaces of pleasure, and you know it's all legal. And actually, <coughs> actually, there is no law against nudity in Switzerland. How do you like that? Meaning, meaning that if you want to walk down Bahnhofstrasse in Zurich in a nude, 
they will not arrest you. They probably will beat you over the head, but they will not arrest you. I'm Swiss German, but I do like the French speaking part and I live my three, four months a month a year I live in a place called Montreux, which is known very well for the Montreux Jazz Festival every year, which for the last year, you know, didn't happen. But that's really where I feel at home. I like the Latin because I have Latin blood in me and I don't know why. I suspect that it must have been the mail the mail carrier because my father was, you know, he was in the military for a while. I don't know what it is, but I'm half an Italian. And uh, every time I go there, I spend a lot of time in Italy. It's my blood, it's the music, um, it's just the whole lifestyle. Love it. Now, um, I'm just trying to place where you got all this personality. I mean, your mother didn't spend a lot of time in Amsterdam cafes during the pregnancy, did she? No, no. She was on the pill. But you know what? She couldn't. She couldn't. Uh, it didn't work with her because uh, when she used them, uh, the pills always fell out. <laughs> and that's what. That's how I happened. You see. Perfect. We're leaving that in. Okay. I'll. You know, you're the judge of that. Do you mind talking about the '59 Cadillac that brought you here? Correct. And, you know, actually, I always wanted to be a car designer. I, at the age of three, I started drawing cars already. And I even have one drawing. My, my brother saved it for me. And um, I always wanted to become a car designer, but uh, Switzerland does not have a car industry. And being my age the way I am, uh, right after the war, you either had to, had to go to Italy, Germany, or France. Well, all three countries they were at the bottom, you know, they had to be rebuilt. And it was not really very attractive to go, to go there. So when it come, came time, I decided to go to plan B, which was fashion design. And I got a degree, four and a half year degree in fashion design. And I worked in the studio doing sport, uh, sport clothing uh, for male, for men and women. I enjoyed that very much, but I didn't like the atmosphere. And when I uh, came to the U.S., the first thing I wanted to do is, okay, now it's the time, car design. And uh, a good friend of mine from New Zealand, he took me to Arts and the College of Design in Pasadena. At that time, I was still in L.A. And, uh, oh my God, I thought I was so great when I saw those illustrations over there. I came out about this big. How about the Cata Jaguar? Am I pronouncing it right? The April Fool's joke. You have to talk to, uh, you know, John Dinkle? Yes. I don't know John Dinkle. I know who John Dinkle is. Yeah. He was editor for Roden Track for quite a while. Oh, forgive me. I actually know John Dinkle. Forgive me. I talked to him on the phone about two months ago. I know John Dinkle. Yeah, he is a crackpot. And um, we had this idea, hey, why don't we fool the people a little bit, you know, for April Fool's Day? And uh, there was a rumor going on that uh, General Motors might buy Jaguar at one time. It was Ford who did it later on. But so we really got it on and uh, I came up with this thing and it was published. And the funny thing about it is the reaction was incredible. Like they should build this car. Uh, You name it, whatever. You know, some people were totally uh, insulted, especially, I guess, the Jaguar people. Uh, but a lot of people said, oh, this is great. This is, the, this is the right mix, you know, and all that stuff. And we cracked up. It was so funny. It got a lot of response. We did not imagine um, to get that reaction. Now, most important, and it may be the only thing we keep on this whole recording, is you meeting Bear Tone in a very special place. That is the truth. And... Um, <laughs> That was in the, in, <laughs> that was the man's bathroom in uh, Stuttgart, Germany. And that was funny. Uh, we were side by side doing our business in the urinals. And he was always blinking like this. And I didn't know who he Well, I knew he was a foreigner. <laughs> so I asked him, sir, are you nervous? He said, no, 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 but it splashes all the time. See, 
<laughs> oh my god. He was doing his business, I was doing my business, and um, we looked at each other and said, Signore uh, Bertone, he said, hey, Signore Sterrenberger, he recognized me too. And we found out we were judges to a uh, auto, motor, and sport magazine. They had uh, some kind of a competition, and we were two of the judges on that thing. And from then on, we were cool. He's, he had a great sense of humor too. I did. And uh, we hit it off pretty cool. He never, he never gave me any work to do, but uh, that's okay. You know, it, it was just a pleasant guy. He's okay for a guy that never gave you work. True. So, do you know, um, know or know of Malcolm Bricklin? Mr. Bricklin, yes, I do know him very well. I had Malcolm on, and we talk from time to time. He's a, he's a sweetheart of a guy to me. But one of his stories was that he was in the restroom at an international, uh, I think on the way to Yugo. Uh, I don't know where he was laying over. But at the urinal next to him and passed him a business card while they were still at the urinals was Henry Kissinger. Mm, and it was red. And it, <laughs> I'll, I'll call him and let him know that you're asking for that detail. Uh, there was just a Brooklyn meeting, right, a couple of weeks ago? That's absolutely right. In um, uh, Bowling Green. Yeah. And uh, he is doing a new thing. I haven't seen your show with him, but uh, he is working on a thing again. You know? He is working on a Bricklin. He has a website, Visionary Vehicles. He It's electric, which I think anything soon or now probably needs to be. And uh, he'd figured out to make to remove a wheel to, for to, for weight and kilowatts and distance and speed and price. He's done a number of focus groups. the The average price in the focus group, if I'm not mistaken, the average top to bottom when they guessed how much is it was like sixty five grand. And the car is supposed to be low twenties. And he wants to, every so many produced, change the body so they're always fresh, etc. Very interesting. You can look at, maybe you'll do a design study. I hope you don't shred it too bad. He's 83, and when you talk... He's still a car guy, you know. And a spark plug. Like, I wonder who's going to outlive who when I talk to him. That's cool. Which brings me, you know, to the electric... Um you know, electric cars and all, uh, the, the plug-ins. I don't know, uh, just, uh, was it 10 days ago, the study came out, maybe you read about it, where they pitted a uh, plug-in car and a gasoline-driven car from New York to L.A. to find out which one was cheaper to operate. Did you read about that? No. Now, well, guess what? Which one, which one was cheaper to operate? Well, be because you're saying gas, so I'm assuming there's some irony, so I'll say the gasoline was cheaper. Uh, actually, you are absolutely correct. But I don't know why. Yeah. Well, they spend about $935.52 for gasoline and one oil change. The electric plug-in car, they spend $32 for electricity, but they spend over $3,000 for the extension cable that runs from New York to L.A. That's perfect. That's perfect. I might just hit you up once a week just for a couple. Do it. Just for a couple. So now speaking of, you know, I had an uncle that I always would get my updated ones every couple of weeks. So um, maybe you'll fill that for a while. But the, the reality of these electric cars makes me a little bit nervous. Um, I, I think you might have read the legitimate news that Mercedes is done with uh, gasoline platform cars, I think, go out in 24? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 20. So, uh, and I'm not trying to take a position. I'm just saying that I don't know. But by the time we get into normal vehicle production and sales, like a bad year, like a horrible year, like a depression year, like 12 million and a and a barn burning year of like 20 million, so mid upper teens millions. By the time you put that many electrics on the road and have to worry about the 
home charging or apartment charging or travel charging, construction of batteries and the materials it takes for that many batteries, and then the disposal, I'm actually, I don't have a punchline here, I'm actually concerned about that. Uh, so I'm not. And, and how about, forget about charging at home, charging at a business. I mean, even if there's charging stations, as long as it takes to charge one, like, what do you do? Set up a table and get a book and a sandwich and wait? Yeah, well, you know, that's where we have to work on, on, on batteries that charge quickly. But, um, and then the, the, uh, the range anxiety, that is a psychological thing that uh, a lot of people cannot deal with. But how about range reality? I mean, you're going to have to route where you can get to a plug unless you have that extension cord that you mentioned. Well, that's why it, it uh, is a good thing to always have snow chains with you and an extension cable. This is interesting. Here's me looking you up because we have some mutual friends and I see your name and I'm like, can it really be him? And I contact you and it was really you. And I got to tell you what a letdown this is. <laughs> You know what? I could have warned you. <laughs> because this is like Mark Sterenberger. This is the guy whose name we would sign like this. This is the guy on the cover of all the road and tracks and the design studies and in the car and driver. This is who Mark went to his school. And I'm, I'm, I'm expecting like Mecca or enlightenment. And, and instead I get the pants potato, a potato in the pants. I know, it's a letdown. I, I understand. Maybe I can prop you up a little bit. You know, um, maybe we can talk a bit. So, do you have, if, in case any of the audience actually wants to hear a little bit about your work because they tuned into the show because they saw I put your name in the title and they're like, oh, this is a guy I grew up with too. So I want to, maybe we give them a little bit of automotive content. So, do you have a favorite among a car that came to production or a design that you submitted that didn't win and make it to production? And then is it one you could provide me that we can show here? Yeah. Obviously, the Cadillac, uh, we started talking about that. That is the car that was the reason why I, came, I wanted to come to the U.S. That was uh, an incredible time, 1959, you know, with the fins and the rocket the exhaust and all that stuff. That was the time when nothing was impossible. And I look at it now, I look at a 59 now, and I look at the fins in the back, and I say, how the hell did they do that in mass production? It's ingenious. It really is to this day. And uh, I'm totally impressed by that thing. But that made me really uh, anxious. I wanted to go to the U.S. I came here in '64. I worked for a lighting company for a while, uh, but then I went to art center at night, took night courses. Never graduated from there. Started working for the magazine. That brought in orders from from some of the car companies. I was there, and then later on, I was invited by Art Center College of Design to to teach, which I thought was cool because I didn't even graduate from, uh, graduate from that. And I taught from 87 to 2002 in Art Center College of Design in Pasadena and also the Swiss camp campus uh, in uh, near Montreux. And that basically made me go back there. They asked me if I wanted to teach over there, which I did. Loved it. Um, fell in love with the place again over there. And that's why I go back and forth. It's, it's my home over there, really. I'm assuming you go in summer. Uh, no. I usually connected it with the Geneva Auto Show, so I could write it off on my taxes, <laughs> um, which is beginning of March. And uh, I'll try to do that again this, this coming year. I hope they will have it. They will, but only on a very small scale. But it was always cool to go there, and uh, the uh, the Geneva was uh, always different from all the other car shows in that you saw the whole world exhibited in, in Geneva. But a lot of manufacturers are leaving the auto shows. That's true. Now, the, obviously, the coronavirus changed the whole night, uh, the, changed everything. Yeah, it, it, it changed world all across. Well, I think it's not all COVID, Mark. I mean, 
I think a lot of it is is the manufacturers are doing like a lot of ride and drive events and putting asses in the seats is better than the masses just gawking at the cars and walking around with their gift bags and brochure bags. And right. But now, you know, they found out, hey, we can do it on the cheap, basically. Okay, so I spend millions and millions on just on the stamps, you know, at the shows. Uh, they don't have to do that anymore. And in some of them, like Detroit Auto Show, I mean, probably the same in Geneva, they got to close the thing down for months while they're preparing the thing. Correct, correct. So, yeah, it has changed. Everything has changed. But uh, we have to sort that out. It will take some time until we have it sorted out. Maybe it is a better thing. I remember, yeah, with the brochures, you know, with the bags full of brochures. Nowadays, they give you a little uh, a flash drive and that's it. How about something that people don't, know about you um what don't they know about me oh there's a whole bunch of things um good stuff or bad stuff <laughs> if it'll get us three more viewers you know whatever but um i, I can ask my brothers and sisters you know that, that would make three um i'm not i'm a nut case okay i said something people don't know oh thank you <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I was on my best behavior here on this show. Gee, uh, what don't they know? Oh, I'm a very compassionate guy. I really am. I can be a hard ass, but I also can I have a, a, a soft heart. I'm very family connected. I've been married three times. Uh, the first wife was Asian. second wife was Irish Catholic. And the third one happened to be black. I have four kids, funny-looking kids from my first wife. They are all doing very well. I'm very, very proud of them. Uh, what else? Had some odd cars in my lifetime. I'm a Toyota driver now. This would be interesting, cars you've had. What have you had? Uh, I guess the one I liked was a... 1929 Ford Model A Phaeton. I like that one. An original car or hot rod? No, no, uh, original, original. With the top, top down, and you know all that stuff. I like that. Problem was, I lived on a steep hill, and it, it had mechanical brakes, and I needed both feet to step on the brakes on the way down, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't slow down anyway. And uh, I always timed it in such a way because uh, I had to cross a main main highway. So I always uh, timed it in such a way that it just turned green. You know, the light just turned green and whoosh, there I go. And when I get on a gas station, when I drive up on a gas station, all the four doors, they opened up because the ladder chassis, you know, uh, went like this. And so all the doors opened, so I had to always close the doors. Eh, one of those things. But it was fun. Uh, Citroen SM. Nice. Love it. Still like it. But still, my favorite is, is the Fiat Multipla 2002. It, and you said also you're into Toyota now. Now I have an Italian job. It's called Menza. People don't, people don't know what it is. What, what does Benza, what does it mean? They're, well, you know, Italian. <laughs> That's right. My wife's Asian. Your uh, ex-wife and children's mom is Asian. And, of course, it triggers, how do you know when you've been robbed by an Asian woman? Uh, tell me. Your computer's updated. Your laundry's folded. And she still can't, she's still trying to back out of the driveway. There we go. <laughs> so what about something that you'd like people to know about you? I'm not a Hollywood uh, thing. Um, I'm not very much impressed with the Hollywood thing. And that might have something to do with my father. Um, he always told me, don't be impressed by titles, you know, by people's titles. Because when they're on the pot, they smell like everybody else. And somehow, this is a funny thing, but um, um, when I see a personality, uh, it, that sentence always comes to my mind, and it puts me at ease. And I find out, you know, uh, yeah, you know what, they are just regular people. 
they really are. Uh, about three years ago, I was invited uh, by the president of Switzerland and uh, was given some award for whatever I did for the Swiss. And uh, we had breakfast together. Cool guy. And, you know, would you be, you know, you would be all giddy and all, and he had the people uh, in uniforms and everything there, and I walked down the, the red carpet and all, and because it was an award show. But the guy was just um, a regular guy. And um, we, we talked like you and I, you know, the regular mundane stuff. And I never was impressed by his title other than that, okay, he was the president of Switzerland, you know. Well, but I mean, you're very comfortable in your skin. This is, this is how you are. And maybe it did come from your father. Um, you made me, and I, I know, I, I just can tell, I like to study people. Um, I know that you make everyone comfortable that you can around you. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm sure you've offended a few. I'm guilty also. But if you find out that you hurt them, you're the first to apologize to. Correct. Because I do know that you keep your foot on the gas, and I do know you hit the railing once in a while. Do that too. <laughs> in life. So I can see this with you, and I can see uh, this guy being a normal guy, a regular Joe, having breakfast you, with you. Probably because you let him off the hook in who he needed to be because you were so normal and regular with him and allowed him off that pedestal. It probably was a break. When, when I was running, Mark, exotic car dealerships, <clears throat> so I was, you know, I was in retail car business for 27 years, but I did the Rolls, Bentley, Lotus, and, of course, all the pre-owned, everything else that came with it, Ferrari, Lamborghini, et cetera, you know, whatever. And so I would meet these, whatever that means, these people often, right? So it could be the business owner or the actor or the athlete or the musician or whoever. And I remember telling my wife that I'm meeting a lot of these people, and I, and I didn't meet Elton John, but I said, and even if I met Elton John, as long as I realize that at most I'm his valet Parker, I'm not one of them, then I won't get my head too out of round and dealing with these people all the time. But I was like you in that I was comfortable and I could let them be comfortable. And they would open up about things. And, and I'm also not like, for, for example, a, a student, I don't follow sports. I don't follow sports. So when I get the athletes and say, you're in good shape, ever do it and think about sports <laughs> and they're comfortable. And, and I remember, do you remember the, uh, the TV pitch man for the oxy clean Billy Mays? Um, black beard. He did like the, 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 the laundry commercials. Yeah. He was a great customer of mine. I went to his wedding. I mean, you know, so we made good friends, probably sold him half a dozen or eight cars or something. Right. And he, he passed away. It was a big loss, but, uh, one thing that was so interesting, because he was a guy that I was hanging out with socially, so it's good that you let these people off the hook, and I feel good that I even wanted to do it more. I found that the guy, if we were walking through an airport or walking through a venue or at a restaurant or whatever, he was always polite to everyone, appreciated everyone. If it wasn't for the fans he or the buyers of the product or watching the commercials, he wouldn't be anywhere, and he always made sure to keep that in perspective. But I saw that he also rarely got a break for three minutes. Uh -huh if he went out anywhere. So I think the fact that you weren't impressed, which doesn't mean that you're turning your nose up. Not at all. No. I, I am impressed, but not so much of the title. I'm more impressed by your personality. The person, right. But you weren't like I was with you already jock sniffing, like a groupie. You know, once in a while I'll walk up to a celebrity that I don't want to make nuts. Like I saw Wayne Carini. Of Chasing Classic Cars, I'm at the Amelia Island Car Show with my son. I see him, and I'm a, I'm a fan. But because I remember running around with Billy and everyone making him nuts every three seconds, he was walking over to the electric cars. That's what he was judging. And I said, Wayne. And, of course, he looks up. I said, look, I don't want to make you nuts. I'm a big fan. I love your show. I gave him a card. I have a podcast. I have 170 listeners right now. I can really advance your show. Can I get a picture? And he laughed and he let me take a picture. But then just get away from him. You know, we don't need to make these people nuts. So, Mark, um, I feel like I'm visiting with an old friend with you. I think this is probably how you make most people feel. 
Uh, yeah, I like to see uh, people uh, comfortable. I like to be comfortable as well. I do know, uh, you do too, that uh, a spot of uh, humor usually breaks the ice. And um, yeah, it breaks the ice, and you and you actually you get your life enjoyment out of seeing the other person entertain. So when you're a teacher, when you're doing your class, are you using a lot of this with the students or are you the strict professor? Very much so. So you're very approachable as the teacher, instructor, professor. Yeah, I don't do teach any, anymore now, but uh, when I was teaching, uh, I had a lot of students from other classes coming over to me. And um, I was, yeah, you could get me, you know, uh, I was accessible, in other words, that's what I meant to say. Um, I enjoyed that very much because what these guys didn't know, they pay a hundred thousand bucks to go to art center, but they don't know that I'm actually learning from them, not the other way around. I had to be on my toes to, to always be, you know, to know the latest and all because they were challenging me. And that in essence made me uh, a more informed person. I kind of miss that now. I don't teach anymore. I do have an uh, invitation to, uh, to campuses to teach. But right now I have a few things that I have to uh, uh, sort out myself. Just going to a divorce, recent recent divorce. So it takes a little time, you know, but uh, I might just take another assignment. But not here in the U.S. Maybe I have one in France. I have one in, uh, in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, I know Hong Kong very well. Uh, don't want to be there right now. It's the climate is not too hot. Maybe France. I speak the language, and, and uh, that's cool. Well, with the third divorce, we know that you're going to need to make a little money. So, let me know what we can support you in. Okay. You know why divorces are so expensive? They're worth it. <laughs> yes, because they're worth every penny. Oh my God. Why do Jewish men die before their wives? I have no idea. They want to. They want to. <laughs> okay. Mark, I'm going to have to cut out the part where I tell you you're my absolute favorite guest I've ever had because I can't offend all my other guests, but between you and I. This has been Jeff Stearns, Connected Through Cars.